My name is Linda Johnson Bell and I am the wine lady from thewinelady.com. I have been a wine critic, an author, journalist, and uh, judge and uh, mostly drinker for a good 25 years and I am also the CEO of the Wine and Climate Change Institute in Oxford, England. I am raising funds on Indiegogo to write, research and market my new book on wine and climate change entitled Blind Drunk. It will be a sequel to my last book on wine and climate change. Uh, why uh, Blind Drunk? The topic is water or wine and this is because this is the major dilemma facing all of our wine producers across the world as our most classic and uh, beloved wine regions are being shriveled by heat and drought. Now as consumers we'd like to know whether or not our eggs are free-range, our chicken is corn-fed or our vegetables are organic but we very rarely ask the same sort of questions about our wine. We may ask where it's from or the grape variety but we don't ask questions of an ecological nature. Um, I think we even have a disconnect and we forget that wine is actually a food crop. Now the Water Footprint Network tells us that it takes five liters of fresh water and that's not green rainfall and that's not grey recycled water, it's blue water which comes from our aquifers. It takes five liters of this water to produce a 250 milliliter glass of wine. When we start irrigating, <clears throat> even in a temperate climate, that rises dramatically to 160 to 190 liters per glass. And when we talk about a drought-ridden region, which is unfortunately most of the New World and Southern Europe as we speak, that rises to 350 and even more than 400 liters per glass of wine. With the headlines screaming about the water wars and the water shortages and the global wine shortage, I would like Blind Drunk to explain how these two storylines are actually completely interdependent and interlinked. People are starting to ask questions. If we can't irrigate, what do we do? Uh, will the wine in the future be um, good wine, bad wine? Or will we have more? Will we have less? Will prices rise? Will they fall? I have friends asking me why wines are starting to taste all the same, or why are they more alcoholic, or why am I getting drunker faster? Um, Blind Drunk will answer all of these questions and also hopefully set the stage for a new wine drinking trend. Um, before, I believe that before there can be organic wines or biodynamic wines or unfiltered wines, which are all good things, I think we need to now start thinking about and having dry farmed wines or rain fed wines. And when I say dry farmed, I don't just mean uh, vineyards that aren't irrigated. There's more to it than that. It means soils that are prepared and maintained so to best retain the moisture from the winter rainfall so they can survive uh, throughout their growing season. This is what is already done in most of Europe, in the old world, and always has been done, though with their recent droughts they're starting to relax their wine laws. Irrigation has always been legal in the New World wine countries. That said, there are pockets of irrigators and dry farmers in both worlds. The, it's not a black and white um, uh, map anymore. Um, the reason that it's been illegal in France and the Old World are both qualitative and quantitative. They wanted to create a level playing field so the wine prices remained fair and stable. So uh, you may have in the top, top wine growth in Bordeaux, that in the Appalachians there, uh, yields are capped at 35 hectoliters per hectare and somewhere else it might be 55 hectoliters per hectare. Um, they also capped the yields for qualitative reasons. But any horticulturist can explain to us and, and tell us that over irrigation can dilute a wine quality, can dilute the uh, influence of the soil and of the wine grape itself. Um, so with all of these headlines screaming about climate change and uh, sustainability and all, all the trends, there, there is one part of the story which has escaped public scrutiny and that's just this. It is the amount of fresh water being used to irrigate our vineyards globally. And what's wrong with this is that we don't really need to irrigate the vineyard. That's a big sweeping statement. It's very general and I will qualify it in the book before I get anybody angry. But we do have dry farmers across the world, not just in Europe, who prove to us year after year, vintage after year, vintage, that this works. And it's not about, um, it, it's about now, I think, 
having to realize that we will no longer have a choice. It will either be dry farmed low yields or no yields. We have pockets of Zinfandel in Napa Valley that have not seen um, irrigation since the late 1800s. There are gorgeous um, wines and grapes coming out of Scotland and South Africa. They're dry farmed. And now even in Chile, one of the worst irrigation offenders, some of the top wine producers are um, huge proponents now of transitioning from irrigation to dry farming. So even, you know, I, I wish I could, you know, I'm sure they're quite aware of the fact that that's kind of always been the way it's been done, but it's starting and it's finally being something people are talking about. Uh, why is this important? Um, it's because the wine industry represents a $300 billion global industry. And the wine grape is our most valuable fruit crop. And it is also the fruit that is the most susceptible to changes in climate, which is why climatologists adore it and refer to it as their canary in the coal mine. And it is so uh, indicative and predictive, you know, susceptible to climatic changes, that using the data from the wine industry, scientists have been able to tell us that by 2050, 75% of the area suitable for wine growing will be gone. That's very scary. And wine producers are reacting to that news by irrigating even more with more fresh water. So perversely, I would like Blind Drunk to explain that the best way to both protect our water supply and our wine supply, and crucially, to ensure that our future wine supply is still good quality, is to dry farm. Now there's a downside to dry farming, apart from the lower yields which bring lower prices, which is a big downside, but that's where the level playing field discussion comes, comes into play, is the fact that not all soils can be dry farmed. Uh, but then that's a question a farmer has to ask themselves. Uh, whether you're a wheat farmer, tobacco, corn, or, or cocoa farmer, that's a basic farming principle. Am I growing the right thing in the right place? Do I have to diversify my crop? Do I have to migrate? Or do I have to cease altogether? So why are grape farmers, wine grape farmers, exempt from that basic principle? I'll tell you why. This is why the topic is so taboo. It's a very painful one. How do you expect a family who has a 500-year-old chateau and vineyard and the history and branding that goes along with that to simply disappear and just, or to stop or grow something else. I think we're all very excited about all the new wines that are coming and the wine regions that are coming onto the global wine map, but I think it's also impossible for us to envision that some of these most of our classic regions will be erased from that same wine map. Um, but that said, those farmers who aren't ready to transition will be very suddenly forced with the decision to either um, change crops, move or stop. Um, especially in the context, like there, are, there are places down in South Australia where the food farmers, you know, the staple crop farmers, are committing suicide because the water licenses are being given to the grape growers so they can sell their, you know, diluted Chardonnay to huge bulk commercial, you know, uh, wine supermarkets. That's people have to know that that's going on. The consumer needs to be aware of this. In fact, this is not at all a niche topic. This, this, this. The drama unfolding in the wine industry today affects the retail drinks sector, it affects um, travel and tourism, it affects uh, biologists, historians, consumers, uh, certainly the investment markets, big time, I'll have a whole chapter on what to invest and where to invest and what's going wrong. Um, and it, it does another satellite um, industries and their players. So Blind Drunk will make clear the universal rev relevance of this topic and uh, answer the so what's and what to do. Blind Drunk won't name and shame. I am an impartial observer. I am a lover of wine, and I support both the consumers and the wine producers. That said, those wine producers who are creating and producing traditional, truly sustainable and well-made wines, not those that are churning out the plonk because they can get away with it. Um, Blind Drunk will explain that good wine is an expensive wine, what to drink and how to drink it. Um, I will create the first rain-fed registry and get that started. But let's face it, if we're sitting in a restaurant with a wine list, how are we supposed to know who irrigates and who doesn't? So I'll give you the tools you need so you can decide that and work that out for yourself. Um, I will also include regions that will be emerging and, and new places to drink wine and, uh, and tell you about the regions that unfortunately we may disappear. And um, I also want, um, I'm hoping that the book opens a dialogue or adds to the dialogue that's starting to emerge and 
aids in the consumer support and understanding of this issue so that the wine farmers can take the decisions they need to take. It has to be easier if they can do it with consumer support and understanding, you know, and it's something we're all talking about and we're aware of. Um, and I think the consumer has a role to play in this. Um, so on that note, I say, uh, let's get drunk on good wine and not water, and I do hope I can count on your support. I will include links below on my previous books, um, my Amazon author page, my published papers um, on viticulture and irrigation, uh, my websites, my YouTube channel, and any other material you may find useful. But thank you very much for listening, and um, have a nice day.